Anin and Way Magadet, Nigago get to Magus Pine Sequa to go Mako and Dodam, Kaubabani Kog, Ishkanaganing and Nunjba, which that's uh, Ojibwe, as you may have gathered. And I'm uh, thanking you very much for the honor of being here tonight with you. And I'm telling you where I'm from, which is the White Earth Reservation up in northern Minnesota. You all know where Minnesota is, is that right? <laughs> very good. I'm someplace between, I'm between Fargo and Bemidji. How's that? Okay, good. Uh, one of seven Ojibwe reservations, or there's uh, Anishinaabe reservations, and there's 19 in the U.S. and about 100 or so in Canada. So quite a few Great Lakes region. I'm going to show a couple slides on that later, but uh, thank you very much again for the honor of being here with you tonight. This moon in our language is, um, this is called uh, Neme Benegizis. Neme Benegizis, which if you translate it, it means um, a sucker moon, which is kind of a fish. Do you have suckers out here? Yeah. Um, then we have um, the one that follows this, my personal favorite mood I like how it sounds, is, um, is Anabonagizis. Can you say that? Anabonagizis? Anabonagizis. I just like how it sounds too, but it means hard crusted snow moon. Which um, I think you understand that, right? <laughs> Snows, then it thaws, and it freezes again. Also known as the moon you don't want to do face plant in the snow. <laughs> and then we have our maple syruping moon. Then we have Wabaganagizis, our flower moon. Um, Odame and a Gizis, strawberry moon. Then we have a moon called Mean Gizis, blueberry moon. Manome and a K Gizis, wild rice making moon. Watebaga Gizis, when the leaves change color. Banakwe O Gizis, when the leaves fall, moon. Gashkad no Gizis, when it freezes over. Manadu Gizis soon's little spirit moon. Gizhi Manadu Gizis, great spirit moon. That's our moons. I wanted you to hear a little bit of our language, but I, I wanted to, uh, you know, there's a couple things you might notice about that. Those, those moons have to do with uh, land and place. Did you also notice that none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor? <laughs> I just want to mention that because it is possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire. <laughs> and I present that to you as, an, as a very uh, significant element of sustainability. <laughs> One might want to look past empire. So having said that, I, uh, I, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, my travels over the past month. Well, I have, to, I have to back up a little bit, but I did come from my reservation earlier in the week at one point. Um, I had a lot of travel since then. I, I, I always say, you know, I, uh, my carbon footprint is kind of high, so I'm really hoping that it's worth it. And I go someplace, you know, because you, you always have to deliberate when you go someplace and you're hoping that what you impart or share will be of some consequence or some help and that it is, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward tomorrow, I'm going to take a road trip, I'm going to go to Macaw. I haven't been there since I was one. That's cool, huh? I haven't been there since I was one year old. I'm, I'm after the Ozette potatoes. <laughs> so anyway, but I, um, it's a long carbon footprint, but um, I, I'm going to tell you some stories that have to do with the topic that we are on tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about my reservation. That's where I started out earlier. The issue of energy is pressing, as it is in every community. But in my community, we have class four wind, pretty darn good, commercial scale. And uh, what I am battling out there is how to get access to the grid if you are a community and you decide that you want to own your power and not sell it. And that's a, that's a very huge issue in this day and age, the question of who should own the next generation of power, if it should be owned by the same guys who own this generation. So that is what I'm going to talk a little bit about. And then I returned I, on my birthday, actually, in August. I have to tell this story because I uh, spent my birthday as a, being cross-examined in New Mexico. Uh, and I'm going back down there pretty soon. But the Environmental Improvement Board of New Mexico, a group called the New, the New Energy Economy, petitioned the Environmental Improvement Board of the state of New Mexico to put a cap on carbon, on CO2 emissions. And in this petition, they requested an incremental approach of 3% per year, beginning in 2012 and continuing with some reviews, according to see how disastrous it would be on the economy, uh, which was, of course, what the opponents had, had suggested. And um, this was proposed to the Environmental Review Board, Environmental Improvement Board in New Mexico. Now, last year, uh, the Environmental Improvement Board took that up. And what happened is, is that the major coal companies and oil and gas companies sued the Environmental Improvement Board and said that they had no standing and they could not regulate carbon. 
and uh, they were sued in San Juan County, which is a largely oil-producing county in New Mexico, and, and um, the, environmental, they, the, the county the court ruled against the Environmental Improvement Board. Appealed to the New Mexico Supreme Court unanimous decision that said the Environmental Improvement Board had the right to regulate CO2. So I was called on as an expert re rebuttal witness for um, I work on the green economy on my reservation. And uh, it was interesting because I got on this, I, I sat there and I, uh, I got up there to talk and it was after eight hours of watching the utility lawyers uh, question a climatologist on, you know, if the snowfall had been so high in one county in New Mexico, did that not constitute the fact that there was no, no uh, evidence of climate change? You know, a number of, you know, eight hours, that's a long time to sit on a stand, you know. I've, I really felt for that guy. And so then I get up at around five, five o'clock or six o'clock, they put me on the stand and, you know, 6.30 by the time, I didn't get off there till 12.30 at night. And I thought, geez, these guys are persistent, you know. <laughs> but I say that because I, that's what I did, but this is a remarkable group of citizens that had proposed this to the Environmental Improvement Board. I get off the stand and, uh, and uh, you know, they continued and, you know, you'll, you'll hear a little bit of what I have to say, but, but I spent a good, good deal of time on that stand and uh, in, in the end, the Environmental Improvement Board adopted the regulation. And then the new New Mexico governor came in and abolished, well, relieved every member of the Environmental Improvement Board of their position <laughs> and subsequently vetoed the regulation. But once again, unanimous decision, New Mexico Supreme Court ruled that the, uh, the regulation would stand. So I tell you that story because sometimes states have to do things that nations do not. My, uh, yesterday I was in Arizona, and, uh, which accounts I think a little bit for the reason why I'm confused as to what date it is today. But I was down there and there's a really a brilliant strategy which is occurring. A lot of you are probably rather enlightened and you remember that the, the Navajo Nation has uh, over many years had uh, five coal fire power plants and four coal strip mines. You know, thousands of abandoned uranium mine shafts and new proposals for uranium mining, oil and gas, and, and huge environmental impacts. Several years ago, a decision was made to close the Mojave Generating Station, which, was in, which is in uh, Nevada. And it was made to, the decision was made by the uh, Southern California Edison because it did not meet, it was polluting. And it did not meet the uh, energy requirements or the, the clean energy requirements of the state of California. So they closed this, this plant after much deliberation, which had, in, in addition to being an egregious polluter, it had 273 miles of uh, slurry pipeline taking pristine water from the, from the uh, Navajo reservation, from the aquifer, and turning it into toxic sludge over in Nevada. Just an egregious crime against nature. It was closed. And uh, now they're looking at the closure of the Black Mesa Coal Strip Mine. And the proposal that I was reviewing yesterday is very, is very interesting and it is karmically, um, what did someone call it? They called it, uh, they called it moral jujitsu. And that is that the Navajo people who for 40 years have watched the coal strip mine take their water, destroy their land, and pollute the air, are now proposing a massive solar plant on the exact site of the coal strip mine, on the lands that Peabody has said it has reclaimed, which that's a whole other discussion. But in that, it turns out that the infrastructure that exists for these mining operations is also infrastructure that could be used foundationally for solar power. So I say that because people um, have brilliant ideas, and I, I actually think that one's gonna, it's gonna pan out. And, uh, and it is important that we, uh, we, we do not, mm, how would I put it, don't compromise your dreams. Don't compromise your beliefs and, and uh, you know, it's taken a long time for those people to get this far. But that's where they are in their proposal. And then finally, I'm gonna show you this here PowerPoint. Well, I just returned from New Zealand here about three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And uh, this is what I presented at this conference, this PowerPoint on, um, on economics. And the question that was asked by 43 economists from 43 countries um, was the question of, of what is the economic model and paradigm that we need to go forward. 
The suggestion was made by economists from, you know, many, many countries. And I think that is something that maybe will resonate with you. That the present economic model is not only not sustainable, it is not replicable. The reality is, is you cannot live in a country which consumes a third of the world's resources. Because this level of consumption and inefficiency requires a constant intervention into other people's territories and constant violations of other people's human rights. That there's only one Mother Earth, and this level of consumption cannot be sustained, nor can it be expanded. And so the question that was asked is this question of what is that paradigm? And so I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like from, you know, this is what I presented at the, at the uh, conference. Um, I, I have a booklet um, that has this cover on it, available from Honor the Earth. It is free. <laughs> Got to download it off the internet. I'm someone who believes in, uh, basically, intellectual capital should be widely accessible. So uh, you are welcome. Honor the Earth is our website, and that's the cover of it. It's a piece of art by Jonathan Thunder. He's from Red Lake. You ever know these artists, and uh, like I saw this piece of art, I actually bought this painting. And uh, it didn't look quite like this. I had him put the wind turbines in it, the, the window was a little different. <laughs> you know, I was like, come on, Jonathan, can you hook me up here this a little bit, you know. But it's a chief from our, uh, Nigani Bene is a chief from our community, and, and to me it represented uh, the past and the future. And the relationship between indigenous thinking and values and what the future is going to look like. But this is the cover of the booklet, the, the uh, altered form. Um, as it were. But, uh, you know, I look at his artwork and I was like, and he said, let me look at the rest of your artwork. And, and I, you know, the rest of it was, um, looked like there was, there was probably a little bit too much drugs involved, but this one was a good one. I like this one. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I lost the thing here. Excuse me. <laughs> um, this is what I present there. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are uh, for my community. And I say this because um, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. I studied economics. But when you wanted to study art at Harvard, if you went to the fine arts, you, if you wanted to study art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department. If you wanted to study art from Native America, you went to anthropology. <laughs> and I say that because that is probably a little bit how it is at most of these institutions. And, and by and large, indigenous knowledge systems, whether it is about uh, how you relate to the natural world, judicial systems, governance systems, uh, political institutions, religious systems, are not valued. You know, even in this university here, by and large, you get a Eurocentric education with some multicultural flavoring. You know, that's the reality. And I'm someone that believes that indigenous, that, that knowledge uh, comes from a multitude of sources. And it is really important that we, uh, that we broaden and be, have the courage to get out of a box if we're going to think about where we're going. So this is our art. Um, this is an adaptation. This is an acrylic painting. Um, by, by a man named um, Gordon Kuntz. But what I want to show you about this art is it reflects a value system. It reflects a set of teachings. Uh, you see a thunder being up there, and you see the animals that are related to our lakes. And uh, what you see between them, they're called, uh, you can see inside the animals and the beings, and you can also see something called spirit lines that re relate. And this is some of our teachings, which I think are basic tenets of sustainability. In our teachings as Nishinaabeg people, and there is a teaching which is in, um, in, well, the first teaching I would say is that the creator's law is the highest law, higher than the laws made by nation states or municipalities. And one would do well to live in accordance with that law. Our second teaching, which is a preeminent teaching, is in Dinaway Maganaduk, which is we are all related. Whether we have wings or fins or roots or hands, we are related. In fact, everyone in this room, we're like 99.9% .9 the same, right? You know, which I don't really depress the white supremacists. <laughs> but, you know, it is our differences that makes us all, all, all the more amazing, you know. But we are all related. Then we have a teaching that is, uh, you take only what you need and you leave the rest. It was very interesting to me, being with the Maoris, because they have almost the same kind of set of values. And that is, a lot of you probably go out and, and harvest your huckleberries or your blueberries, or I was trying to get a handle. What were we talking about? The Logan berries and the, there's a lot kind of berry discussion during lunch today. Or mushrooms. You guys pick mushrooms out here too? You don't take them all, right? You got to leave some of them in there because that is how you are ensured that, you, that there will be more, right? You take only what you need and you leave the rest and you're thankful for that what you take. Yeah? And then we have this teaching, um, which is that, um, 
this teaching that one would refer to as, it comes out of the Iroquois perhaps said it the best, which is, in each generation, one must consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. In each generation. So when we make deliberations, or in each deliberation, one must consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. You know, um, I was reviewing some uh, work on this, but you know, that is to say that we are the ones who are present. Those others have not yet arrived, and they are counting on us to make good decisions so that you can, they can still drink the water, you know, that the air will be fit to breathe, and that there will still be trees. You know, and that requires a, really a conscious and an active process. It's like democracy. It's not a spectator sport. You have to engage, you know, uh, and each generation has had to. You know, as I reflected when I was at this in, in this economics conference, there's a lot of similarities between some of these principles and, and uh, broader ecological principles, but it is, it is a question, and that is what we aspire to, perhaps, in part, is that it is not only, it's an intergenerational justice question of economics, that this generation does not have a right to destroy that which the next generation has not yet been here, yeah? But it is also uh, intergenerational in that we, uh, you know, those of us who do not have amnesia know where we came from, you know? And we know that our ancestors, our great, 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 greats, did not fight as hard as they did, whoever we are, for our right to be, you know, complacent people who sat there and basically, you know, played on the we and went shopping. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty clear on that. That my ancestors did not fight for my right to do that. You know? And, and so I consider that because we are these people who have this opportunity to be great. And we, have this, we are these people who have this opportunity to be mediocre. You know, and it's kind of on each of us. So that is, you know, what we think about in terms of these teachings. I'm going to, um, that, that comes and it is reflected a little bit in our art, you know, this, these concepts. Um, this is a little bit about where we're from. Uh, this guy here, we're talking about the Boundary Waters. These are largely, you see a lot of these in the Boundary Waters, but you got a canoe to get there. I don't know, I don't have a good map of our indigenous communities, our, our Ojibwe communities, but I want to put that up there because this is some old stuff. You know, these are called pictographs and um, they're like, oh, they're old, we'll go with they're old. You know, uh, in our area, and that's our traditional territory, that's what I would say. Uh, this is uh, another piece of our art. This is an artist named Rabbit Strickland. This is my Cosmo genealogy. I heard that word from the Hawaiians. There's one guy here, a guy from Makua. And uh, I never heard that word before I met the Hawaiians. And um, those Hawaiians were explaining why they did not want taro or kalo genetically engineered. Yeah. It's an interesting case. But what they said, I'm going to tell you what they said. Because in their, in their teaching, I, I don't know if I got this right, but basically they descended from the earth and the, the, earth and the sky and in that, there was two children born. The first child born in, in Hawaii was, was uh, Kalo. And he was stillborn, a stillborn child. And he was buried, and he became today what is known as Taro. The second child born was Kane, which is the Hawaiian. And so they refer to Taro as their older brother. And that is what I'm saying is we are all related. And so when the discussion of genetic engineering came up with them, they said, we, we do not want our cosmo genealogy genetically engineered. That's a heck of a mouthful, huh? <laughs> That's my cosmo genealogy there as an Anishinaabe person. That's Nokomis and Nana Buju spirit beings from which we as Anishinaabe descended, and they are rising. Painting done by this guy named Rabbit Strickland. If you ever look his stuff up on the internet, he's amazing. Self-taught. His stuff looks like Botticelli. You know, it's like six by 10, six by 14, giant Cosmo genealogy paintings. <laughs> Very interesting. And you know, when I met him, he was homeless in San Francisco. Isn't that interesting? You know, you don't, never know who is homeless. The most brilliant people are. But uh, he's doing good now. That's also who we are. I thought I'd show you this briefly. This is a... Uh, our moons and our seasons, it's Bibu now, or winter. We are going into uh, spring, Siguan, uh, Nibin, which is summer, and then Dagwagan. But the other reason I show you this is because uh, there's two forms of writing up there. One is Roman orthography. The second form of writing is known as syllabics. 
which is uh, how we write our language. It was, you know, uh, I like looking at it and I don't know. How, how many of you ever seen that syllabics before? Some of you? Inuits, Crees, and Ojibwe's right in, that way, in the northern, huh? But I, I, I say that to you because and I'm, I guess I'm trying to impress upon you the idea of getting, getting out of a box and ensuring that, you know, as we think, we remember that uh, the, the paradigm in, in the world is larger than a lot of times that what we are used to. You know, and if we're gonna, if, uh, I think I heard Wes Jackson say it once, he said, you know, sometimes when you dig yourself into a hole, you should probably just quit digging. <laughs> All right, there's three sets of issues that, you know, briefly I know you know about. But, uh, so I'm a rural development economist, and I'm gonna show slides about our work on our reservation, but as we consider where we are today, we need to consider not like exactly just where we are at this moment, but what is go coming down. You know, and the reality of what is coming down is we already raised the temperature in one degree, we're on our way to two, moving pretty accelerated fast. I heard, you know, four to 10, 15 years, I don't know. I heard different numbers about how long we got to cap CO2 emissions, you know? And we can talk about it and they can talk about it, but really you gotta, you gotta, you gotta quit with the CO2 combusting here. This is, the, uh, this is a Kivalina up in Alaska. It's falling into the ocean, as you see. Uh, it's the Alaska Native Village. They sued a bunch of oil companies and coal companies. Um, the price tag for this village is, uh, from what I understand, uh, $400 million. Get them a new village. I don't know who's in charge of paying this. They say by about 2020, 2025, we'll be spending 20% of world GDP, or world, you know, basically world wealth, on climate change related disasters. So, you know, as you do your stock projections, you look at your portfolio, you might want to think about that. You know, um, this is the reality of what we're looking at. And the question that um, I am looking at my own community, which I think a lot of you are probably considering, is the question of how you create and ensure resilience in a time of climate change and, uh, and how you try to avert more cataclysmic climate change. A second issue that I'm working on is uh, this issue of peak oil. I'm sure you're all relatively familiar with this. I had to counsel my son who could not drive before I had consumed half the world's no oil resources. He's still in counseling. <laughs> He's, uh, I did, however, because I am a, an, a uh, resourceful woman. I did buy the kid. I went to California, I went to Berkeley, and I got the kid a, uh, I got my son a 1983 Mercedes that runs on grease. <laughs> so he can still get around. And we are actually the first, uh, I'm the first fry bread grease powered Mercedes on the White Earth Reservation. <laughs> and I am uh, highly regarded. <laughs> My kids sometimes are kind of like, Mom, can you quit yet? But uh, I also am a multicultural grease collector. I, I go to rodeos as well. There's a lot of grease at rodeos. <laughs> and and uh, collecting grease is kind of like, it's kind of like drug deals from what I see. You kind of go out back, you say, got any grease? <laughs> And you bring, and you take the grease and bring it home, and then, uh, you know, so I told my son, town is a four-letter word in my house, it is 38 miles from my house. So I say, you want to go to town, go cook up your grease and head out, so. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the rest of the world does not, uh, apparently has not met the hippies of San Francisco and got the grease-powered Mercedes, but uh, you can go find one. Um, they're still there. But anyway, having said that, the reality is that's where we're at. Uh, we consumed half the world's known oil resources. The rest of the oil is in places that we are not going to get it or it's, we shouldn't be trying to get it at all. That would be, you know, first example would be uh, countries that might not want to give us oil. You know, you got a $100 billion a year war right now. Canada Ford's second war for oil. That is just a mathematical and economic reality. May have ambitions for a new war, but cannot afford it, right? Not all countries are going to give us a wrap. Second uh, is we're trying to get it in places we should not. Obviously, uh, offshore oil, you know, bottom crack of the bottom of the ocean in China, crack at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, you know, deep water horizon. Some places you should just not go after oil. And then third evil, which is, of course, the uh, great North American evil, would be this one. Majority of the oil in the state of Minnesota is coming from the tar sands. Good chunk of U.S. oil is now coming. Heavy hauls is moving on Highway 12. The first four, I believe, Conoco shipments are moving in with the, with the significant goal to move 207 Imperial oil shipments of basically death machines down Highway 12. 
actually up the, you know, first up the, got to barge them up the Columbia River to Lewiston, right? Drive them over the Nez Perce Reservation on that switchback road, Highway 12, and then take them into Montana and drive them up to Alberta. Single largest industrial project in world history, right there. The amount the U.S. has squandered on it is $60 billion, which in my personal opinion could have put in some light rail. <laughs> right? Got some fuel efficiency in cars, no reason to go destroy the entire northern tundra region of Alberta. CO2 emissions from that are higher than 97 nations. They call that Project Mordor. That's what it looks like up there. <laughs> it's evil. And uh, the challenge of that is that that's the next step. Once they succeed in Canada, they will, they will roll that out. Now the problem that we face as a country is, is that we are uh, addicted. You've got a really large and inefficient petroleum-based economy. And in that, when, you, when you're addicted to oil, you basically do a lot of bad stuff and hang out with dealers. And that's where we're at. And so the extent of our addiction drives a lot of really bad policy decisions, ecological decisions. And the question is at what point we recognize and address our addiction. So these are the issues that I'm dealing with, or we're looking at in our community. Uh, Devon. I would say Devon, but we, we, we're talking about this at supper. So in the discussion on the transition to the next energy economy, those of us who are proponents of renewable or natural energy are frequently told that we cannot meet present demand. My argument would be, why would you want to? The reality is between point of origin and point of consumption, about 57% of the energy is wasted in this country. The tar sands in themselves are highly inefficient use of largely natural gas to produce tar sands oil, which is then shipped. You know, one of the brilliant examples, this is how brilliant it is, is they just put in 200 megawatts of wind in South Dakota. And I went and I saw the PUC commissioner there. He told me, I said, he said, we just put in some wind, Ms. LaDuke. I said, oh, that's great. He said, but we sold the power even before we got it online. I said, what did you use the power for? He said, to power the tar sands pipeline. There you go. So what I'm saying is, is that you've got a massively inefficient energy equation that exists in this country. And the proposal, it, it is always put up as a false debate that renewable energy should meet this level of consumption. When reality, what needs to happen is efficiency, decentralization. And then you could talk about how power is, needs are met. So this issue is, uh, the, the third issue is intimately related to this, and you are all familiar with this. Fact is, the average meal travels 1,546 miles from farmer to table. You know, I did say I was just in New Zealand. I ate a lot of kiwis over there. I try to avoid them here. You know, 14,000 miles is a hell, of a long, hell of a long way to move a kiwi. You know, it's an absurd energy equation, and it's an absurd food equation. But the reality is, you know, I come from a reservation in northern Minnesota that the price of food is already high. As the price of oil increases, the price of food will increase, increasing food insecurity in most of our communities. And most of us have become people who know how to shop, but we don't know how to grow. And so these questions are increasingly going to drive more challenges in communities of all uh, economic um, and, and you know, other backgrounds. So in our work on White Earth, I'm going to show you a snapshot of something which I don't know if you've done this out here, but a Yakima, all our reservations should do this. And I think that you have done some of this work out here. Um, we did a study on White Earth where we, we looked at how much we spent on our food, interviewed households, and aggregated the data. And in that, we found that we spent about $8 million on food on my reservation. And of that, 86%, almost all of it was spent off reservation. Uh, Food Service of America and Walmart within just a few days. 14% that's spent on reservation was spent largely at convenience stores buying junk food, right? And uh, so that represents, this figure represents about a quarter of the uh, food, eco of the economy of my reservation is spent on that, and that quarter basically leaks. 
And so as I look at, you know, uh, re our reservation economy and other, other economies, and this is not, you know, like I said, I work mostly on reservations, but any rural county probably has very similar statistics. Uh, the question usually posed, I would say, falsely to, uh, you know, by elected officials or to planners is how you generate more full-time employment and bring more jobs in. And the reality is, is that you can keep trying to bring more jobs in, but so long as you got a leak that represents a quarter of your economy, you got a hole that you should probably, you know, stop. The other, uh, and, and it has huge implications. I mean, the other quarter of your economy is energy. On my reservation, similarly, about a quarter of our money is spent on energy, and it is entirely outsourced. Uh, the implications of that food economy that look like that are this on my reservation. My grandson goes to this school, and my son went to this school. Uh, eighth grade BMI index, body mass index. Um, I don't know what the indicators are in the Seattle public schools, probably a little bit better, but 50% of the kids by grade eight on my reservation tribal schools are obese. And that has to do with a number of things, you know, access to bad food, a lack of physical activity, way too much Nintendo or whatever, right? Corn syrup. Corn syrup, yeah. I mean, the full, the full gamut. But I say this because that's a snapshot of a lot of kids, you know, this age group in America. And, uh, you know, it has, it's, it, you know, that the approaches have just generally been, you know, on an individual basis. And the reality is, is that a lot of these issues are very systemic. And that's what we're looking at in my community. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two things that we're doing. One is this issue of food sovereignty. This is a, a young man named Ivan Curry. He's one of my favorite kids. And Ivan Curry is holding a squash called a Lakota squash. And why I like this squash, uh, we are raising these foods in our community. This Lakota squash, actually, that's a... And, and a we're raising uh, real old varieties of corn, different beans. This squash in itself, I, I had a, a, one of the squash was given to me by his father. And in, uh, they gave it to me in October and we ate the squash in May. <laughs> now my kids thought it was a science experiment. It was a little bit of an experiment. But why I'm telling you this is because the squash was perfect in May. So if you're looking for a low carbon food, that'd be squash. Because it's a pumpkin, a, a Lakota squash will do that, but a pumpkin won't last. You understand what I'm saying? And this whole question of, of it's, it's not just what you grow locally, it's not just growing locally, it's also what you grow. And the nutritional value of this uh, squash is, is higher in antioxidants and amino acids than pretty much anything you can buy at the store. These are heritage varieties, not genetically engineered and not hybrid. And so I say that because these are really important considerations as we restore our local food economies. This is our corn restoration project. Um, you know, we're trying to get our food economy to be largely local, and so we've been working on these three, these are three of my varieties, no, two of my varieties I'm trying to grow out, and this one here is, uh, uh, I, I don't grow yet, this Pawnee Eagle corn, that's not mine to grow. Uh, but this first one here is uh, Jonesy Miller. He's from uh, Menominee Reservation. I gave him those seeds. And we got this much seed from a seed bank in Iowa. I got this much seed. And then we start growing it out in Bear Islands, an island in the middle of the Leech Lake Reservation. And it's kind of a microclimate. And the deer don't go there in the, in the summertime because they, they got to swim a long ways. And they just don't go there, right? And so you could grow a lot of corn on that island. And so our people grew on that island. They liked that corn. And that variety is very interesting because it's about this tall. And when it, uh, it's about uh, shoulder length, I guess is what I'm trying to say, shoulder length tall. And it has big ears. And um, it, it doesn't require irrigation. And it doesn't require, um, yeah, doesn't require irrigation. And it's frost resistant. And so what I'm telling you is, is that what we are trying to do is restore corn varieties and food varieties that are, I'm call, I call them climate change resistant. They got a shot. And we grew this corn and, and, you know, four miles away from us down the road, there's some guy growing Roundup Ready corn. And what happened is, is that when a wind sear came through, which is a horizontal wind, that wind sear came through and it knocked down the Monsanto corn, but our corn was still standing. So I say that because when you're growing food in this time, you got to consider the changes that are occurring. You can't just grow for now, you got to grow for what is going to be happening next. Uh, in the middle is this pink lady flower corn. It is a magenta corn in color. It's stunning. And I, I like it very much. Uh, there's no real reason I grow it except for it tastes good and it's pretty. 
<laughs> and I'm the executive director, so I made that decision. <laughs> But this corn here on, the, on this, this side, I, I, I was given the permission to tell this story. Um, there's a woman named Deb Echohawk, and she is the Pawnee seed keeper, and she lives in, in Oklahoma. And a long time ago, the Pawnee lived in Nebraska, in a place called Kearney, Nebraska, or in Nebraska, and they, were, they, were, they did pretty good. The Pawnees are actually uh, related to people who live up in the Missouri River area, uh, to that Rickera. But they had moved down there, and they're down there, they're living pretty good, and then the settlers came in. And they got along pretty well with the settlers, you know. Some people have, have better relations with, you know, settlers that come in and, than others. And they're doing pretty good. They used to, she said that they used to call us, uh, they'd say, like, we were like AAA. Like, if your wagon wheel wasn't working, call the Pawnees. Or if your horse was lame, call the Pawnees. They were, you know, they, they, they were, you know, if, you're, if someone was in labor and you needed a midwife, call the Pawnees. It was really interesting. Like, they had built this relationship with the settlers, and they're doing pretty good. And then what happened is, is the U.S. government and its infinite greed and evil um, decided to, to force them out, right? <laughs> Pretty much. And, they, and so they forced their removal to Oklahoma. And so many of their people died and perished on the way. And they went to Oklahoma. And when they went to Oklahoma, um, they, you know, they, they have a village there called Pawnee, Oklahoma. And they did okay, but their, their seeds did not grow. And so they grieved because their, their corn is a part of uh, their spiritual ceremonies and it is in their medicine bundles. And their seeds dwindled. And so they started in the late 1990s trying to bring back their seeds. They were working with different you know, guys and different ideas to bring them. They had a hard time. And uh, so one day, Deb Echohawk gets this call from Ronnie O'Brien. I, I met both these women, I, their story. And she said, Ronnie O'Brien runs the Gateway Museum in Kearney, Nebraska. And Ronnie O'Brien said, uh, we'd like to grow a traditional Pawnee garden here. And so could you provide us some seeds? And Native people are you know, a little nervous about some of these things, so they deliberated long and hard about releasing the, their precious remaining seeds to this uh, woman, Ronnie O'Brien. But they deliberated, and they decided to send some. And so they sent the seeds, and they flourished. And uh, Ronnie O'Brien began to grow them out, and then the other farmers in the area of Kearney, Nebraska, began to grow them out. And what Deb Echohawk said is that the seeds remembered the land they came from. And uh, that process is something that is, uh, it, it began a relationship between the descendants of the settlers and the modern day Pawnees. And it helps them this is how corn helps you restore relationship. Because they, they began to rebuild a relationship um, between these people uh, with this, over this sacred food. And then last year, two years ago now, they had a Welcome Home Pawnee celebration in Kearney, Nebraska at the Gateway Museum and 8,000 people came. So I tell you that story because I believe in redemption. And I tell you that story because history is made by people. And people, do, people can do great things. And sometimes it takes a while to work it out. But everyone has the opportunity to do something great. And those farmers and um, their descendants and the, the Pawnees who had descended have uh, began a great process. And so um, we're working with like, different farmers in our area. And I, I have a lot of those stories to tell from that relationship that we have. But corn is something, we as Anishinaabeg people are the northernmost corn growers in the world. We push corn 100 miles north of Winnipeg. That indigenous knowledge is not by and large taught in these universities. But we're the greatest corn growers. And we have knowledge that, uh, that uh, surpasses everything that they, those guys knew, you know? But in that, um, in this day and age, you know, our work is now to bring those seeds home and to recover those and to recover that knowledge. So this is from our community. This is our wild rice. Some of you know this story. We do market this. So it's called Native Harvest. But we, uh, we have millions of pounds of wild rice, and we won a battle, similar to the battle won by the, um, by the uh, Hawaiians. Um, we won a battle to keep the wild rice from becoming genetically engineered. Because <laughs> I'm someone that believes uh, that wild should mean something. And that would not be genetically engineered. I'm also someone that believes that wild should mean something in salmon. In this case, uh, that's how we harvest our rice, two sticks in a canoe, 
we bring it in like this and then we uh, parch it over fire. And I say this because in our local food economy, we make a set of choices as to technology and fuel. And those are choices available to all communities on how you, because a lot of people in this day and age, they process their wild rice with, uh, with uh, natural gas or propane, but we don't. Because we believe that uh, that's how the Creator intended for us to do it. We adapted some technology, but we basically do it pretty much the same as it was from the old days. This story here, I just, said, I just returned from uh, New Zealand, from Aotearoa. And this is uh, Peru Peru, which is a potato from uh, over there. And in that, um, this potato, very interesting story. Uh, Maoris grow it, they grow a number of, I, I had, of course, as you can imagine, had to sample quite a bit of their food. <laughs> but this here potato, I said, uh, uh, I said, what's the story on this potato? And they said that this potato has a very high rate, uh, level of Andean genetics. It comes from the Andes originally. And I said, uh, and so, you know, these people, BC, that would be before Columbus, <laughs> cruise out in their giant canoes from Tahiti, New Zealand, Aotearoa, over to Easter Island or Rapa Nui, go get these potatoes, bring them back. That's some navigation. Yeah? And they grew in those potatoes for a really long time. So I wanted to tell you that because uh, it's a remarkable story, but uh, about five or six years ago, I don't have this all down yet, I'm working on this whole thing, but they uh, told me that about five or six years ago that um, the university, one of the universities in New Zealand wanted to genetically engineer this potato. You know, and this is one of the things about genetic engineering. And my position with wild rice is just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Some things you just leave alone because they have a story. And what the, what the Hawaiian taro farmers will tell you is, is, that, is that the answer is in biodiversity, not in creating a genetically engineered monocrop. And so this here with the potato is the same thing. And so who fought it off this time was the Maoris. They protected that potato. And it was a great, uh, it was a great thing that they did. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the Hakka or the Maoris, but you do not want to mess with them when they are mad. <laughs> um, and this is what I spent my time doing earlier. This is the poster from their campaign. I like that. They're doing this where they, where they come up. That's how they greet each other. They breathe into each other. Baza Maori with the Ayamara guy. And that's the campaign for their potatoes. That's their story. And that's why I'm going to Macaw tomorrow. I want to hear their story about how they got their potatoes. But I, li I like that, that there. Uh, this is our energy answer. I know you're all waiting for my energy part of the lecture. Here we go. I gave you some earlier. This is my wind turbine. Uh, <laughs> This is a 75 kilowatt lowland wind turbine. Now, I know that you are all wondering what that is. It is, I, I took it out of Tehachapi Pass in California. It was still running when we took it. Uh, if you ever go to Tehachapi Pass, it's got a, uh, it's kind of like a museum of wind turbines of the scale, and now, by and large, the U.S. wind industry is, has separated into two major streams. One is small, household size, and one is very large. That's where the big markets are. I am interested in the question of medium-scaled wind, because what I own, or what our organization, the White Earth Land Recovery Project, owns on the White Earth Reservation is a school. And what happened is, is that in 2003, Callaway Elementary School wins the No Child Left Behind Award. 2004, they put 1.5 million in renovations into the school. 2005, they closed the school. <laughs> Consolidating the school district, busting, busting the largely native kids into the town, right? 2006, they sell us the school for $250,000. So that's my office, that school. And so the size that, of energy that is required for that is this size. I could put up a whole bunch of very small 20 kilowatt machines or one kilowatt machine, but I decide to put up one. So I take this turbine from, we take the turbine from Tehachapi, we send it to some engineers, and they put it, uh, they rebuild it, the gearbox, so that it runs at a lower wind speed and a lower temperature. 
And then they make a new control panel that is, is able to be operated by someone with some basic training. In other words, you don't need a nuclear physicist to operate my control panel. Now, uh, this is about the size of the school, but what I'm, the, the other thing that we did is that this guy who's in the middle of this project, this is a guy named Tony Tibbetts, and Tony um, is a veteran. He's from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And Tony Tibbetts, uh, my mother is who talked to him, but uh, in, this, in this case, what we're talking about is that he, he was working on horses out in our community, and my mom was talking to him, and I knew he was a vet, 26 years in the military. Um, special, special forces, a lot of things that I did not want to know that my tax dollars did. We'll go with that description for Tony. And as my, my mother's getting the sequence, and I'm thinking like pretty much everywhere Tony was at the same time, there was like some takeover of the government. So I said to Tony, I said, what did you do in the military? And he gives me kind of a vague set of answers, and then he says, well, I did take out a lot of, I did a lot of demolitions work. I took out a lot of power plants and, and a lot of dams and communications towers. That's what your tax dollars do, just in case you're wondering. And I said, uh, do you have a degree to do that? And he said, yeah. I have a master's in engineering. Uh, so, so I said, with such a master's of engineering, can you build things or do you just blow things up? <laughs> and Tony said, I can build things. I said, well, how about you take this tower, which is a Nortank tower, and you put a, put a transition tube in it and then help me get this uh, re-engineered. And so that's what someone who is in the military for a long time can do. And I use that as an example because in our native communities, we have the highest rate of enlistment and we have the highest rate of living veterans of any community in the country. And with each subsequent war, we have more living veterans. And the reality is, is that there is not a transition program for most of those veterans where the military and technical knowledge that they learned in the military can be reapplied to the civilian economy. But green energy, appropriately scaled energy, whether it is solar or wind, is a perfect transition economy. And since this is the largest economy in the country, the energy economy, one might do well to figure out how to transition into that. And there is the, the absolute basis of your labor force. I helped Tony wire the bottom. I, 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 what we will say is that I passed small pieces of paper to Tony that had numbers on them. <laughs> and what I realized as I observed him in the wiring of this turbine, uh, the control panel, was that it was a lot like building a bomb. And it's way better to wire a control panel than to build a bomb. So that's our turbine. This is us going up. This is a crane out of the city of Detroit Lakes. I say that because this scale, it's 82 feet tall. I did not have to get a crane from Denver to put it up. And uh, that's what you get to say in Ojibwe Nashke, or ta-da. And that's our turbine, and I apologize, but my grandson had a hold of my cell phone when that photo was taken. So that's what it looks like. Now I'm in the middle of, st I'm still battling with Autotail Power Company on that grid, but we will, we'll be good by this summer. And uh, the other thing about putting up a wind turbine that is really great, I don't know if you know this, but you get to say that you had an erection. So it's entirely liberating. You could say, I had, we had a really big erection over there in Callaway. In fact, I had an erection party in Callaway. <laughs> Hundreds of people came. We all celebrated. It was great. This project we just completed in October down on the Navajo Reservation. Let me put it this way. I raised some money for it. I leveraged the rest of the money from that Mojave generating station closure because they had set up an escrow account that was required to be used for renewable energy. So Grand Canyon Trust forked over 100,000 and my organization put up 25,000. I sent down my staff, Nellis Kennedy, who's a Navajo woman, to make sure everything went well because I'm not, oh, patient would not be my strongest suit. And she came back and she showed me this picture and you know what I said? I said, holy buckets, because I had no idea that I had worked to finance such a large system. But that's Diné College in Shiprock, New Mexico, where after a five-year battle with, to, for a coal plant they're trying to put up called Desert Rock, bad idea. The plant looks like it's not coming up and instead they got solar. 
So that's what we just did here, and that's, uh, we're trying to, they're, they're looking at replicating that. It's 20 kilowatts, it's not immense, but part of the discussion needs to be this whole question of as you rebuild your energy economy, you must build it local. It must have local uh, power, must serve local communities. The whole question of how it, it moves, like in, our, in the case of my, uh, my office, we put it into the building and then we sell it to the grid because I'm buying power for 10 cents a kilowatt hour and they buy it from me for 5 cents a kilowatt, right? 10 cents or 5 cents a kilowatt. So in other words, generally the, we are encouraged to sell to the grid, but the math is bad. Much better, keep yourself, sell surplus. But that is the model that has to be challenged at many of these public utilities commissions. And so what I'm saying is, is that we have ideas that we work on but it's a battle every step of the way. And that requires repeated enlightenment and, and also just strong public support. Because in the end, distributed power that is local is an entirely different model than the model we presently have. And in rebuilding this, um, we you know, have a shot at kind of rebuilding some kind of a dignified energy system. Now, I forgot what the next slide is. Oh. This is why uh, the larger implications for Indian country, turns out the Indian reservations are the windiest place in the country, go figure. <laughs> there you go. My reservation is that blue dot, big blue dot in northern Minnesota. Windiest India res Indian reservation in Minnesota, we could power ourselves and power a good portion of Minneapolis if we so chose. Ah, my last slide in this. As I was uh, presenting, at the, uh, at the uh, New Zealand conference in Aotearoa. President at that conference was uh, one of the economic ministers from the country of Vanuatu, and also a uh, leading economist from, from Costa Rica. Now, I don't know if you know much about those two countries, but they both recently won the, I think it's called the, the Happy Planet Award. I don't know, you follow this, do you know what I'm talking about? Well, anyway, what these guys are talking about is a different set of indicators. The indicators they're talking about is access to clean water, access to traditional foods, education levels, security for women, um, security for elderly people, uh, good health. So for many years, Vanuatu won this award. And then last year, they were unseated by Costa Rica. And I, uh, I, was, I was, of course, in my way making fun of them. I said, so what happened there, Vanuatu? And Vanuatu call, uh, cried, cried foul. They said that, in fact, there had been faulty data and that they should have won the award one more time. But there's something you will note about both those countries. No military. You know, almost entirely renewable energy, good portion of local food. Interesting, you know. So this was my uh, response to them. I said, uh, give me 10 years and White Earth will win the Happy Planet Award. There we are. We're going to come after you guys. Here we are, our people. So this morning when I was on the uh, radio, some guy called in. I don't know if any of you heard that. Some guy called in and he called me radical. <laughs> and I said, I actually consider myself to be really conservative. Because what I am proposing and what we are talking about considers the seventh generation from now. And that is conservative thinking. I'm not thinking about this fiscal year. I'm not thinking about this last year's pro last profit quarter. And, and thinking that far ahead forces you to be more conservative. This whole question of re redoing the question of what is valued is, has been debated in this country for years. The reality is, is that GDP is not, does not measure quality of life. And that yet, in our own colonization or, or a box that we get ourselves into, we often think that if you make more money, you'll be happier. So here's a quote, 1968. GDP counts air pollution and cigarette advertising, ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for those who break them. It counts the destruction of our redwoods and the loss of our national, natural wonder to chaotic sprawl. 
It counts napalm and the cost of a nuclear warhead and armored cars for police who fight off riots in the streets. Yet the GNP does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. Does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither, neither our wit or courage, neither our wisdom or our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to country. It measures everything in short except for that which makes life worthwhile. And it tells us everything about America except why we are proud that we are Americans. 30 years ago, that quote, University of Kansas lecture by Robert F. Kennedy. So the debate on where we go has history. The proposals I stand before you and discuss, I would not argue are radical. I would say that thinking in a time of reduced access to petroleum, climate destabilization, and increasing food insecurity is in fact absolutely essential thinking. In that, what, you know, we, we have this opportunity to do it right. But that requires in itself for us to give ourselves permission to have courage. What we're doing at White Earth, my theory is, if we can do it, anybody can do it. Because nobody would bet on us, right? Every statistic you do not want to have, we have. But what we are is pretty determined. And we know that as native people, you can either be at the table or you'll be on the menu. <laughs> we also know that, you know, in uh, one of my favorite words, one of my favorite words is a Yiddish word. It's kvetch. You ever heard this word? Kvetch. It's a great word. Some place between complain and bitch. <laughs> Wine and bitch, maybe, right? Well, what is that? That is to say that we could complain about what is wrong and we could wait for someone to fix it. And I hate to impart this to you, and I hope it's not a news flash, but no one in Washington is going to fix this situation. You know, Brother Obama has got his hands full in a few problems. You know, the reality is, is that change is made by individuals. It's made by people with courage. It's made by people who, who decide to rise to their higher ability and, and to think outside of a box. You know, what we are doing at White Earth could easily be replicated. The reality is, Lester Brown says you spend $110 billion a year over the, last, the next 10 years, you got a shot at having, you know, land that we can feed ourselves from, restoring soil, restoring, uh, you know, watersheds, oceans, forests, and renewable energy. 110 billion a year, what are we spending on the war? Pretty much that same thing. It's what you decide to do with your money, right? It is uh, imminently possible to make change, and it is quite essential. So I want to thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer a few questions, but I appreciate very much your company for this last hour. Miigwech.